Okay, so we're on to LSH or locality sensitive hashing with random projection. In the previous video in a series, if you're if you're following it, we covered LSH, but we covered the more traditional version of it with shingling, min hashing, and LSH. What we're covering here is, I suppose, more of like a uh, a modern implementation of it, and this is what you'll see in libraries like Feist, which we'll, we'll work through later on how to actually implement this in Feist. So what we're going to cover in this video is specifically LSH random projection. We're going to work through a few visualizations, to try and get a, a grasp of what it is actually doing. And whilst we're doing that, we'll also work through how we implement that in very simple Python code. For the FICE implementation of this, which is obviously much more efficient than what we'll be covering in this video, we will cover that in another separate video to this, because otherwise it's just huge, a, a very long video. So if you would like to see that, I'll make sure there's a link to that in the description. So let's just recap very quickly on you know, what is LSH. So at the top here, we have this first kind of row, if you like. Um, here we're minimizing collisions. So this is a hash function, this, this blue bit in the middle, and these are vectors on the left. And we're passing through a hash function and it's making sure that we put both of those into separate buckets. That's minimizing collisions. LSH tries to do the opposite and what it does is maximizes collisions but it only tries to maximize collisions for similar vectors not just everything so lsh in short is a hashing function that tries to bucket similar vectors together now when we're performing search with lsh we have all of our I would say database vectors indexed already. So they've all been bucketed. Imagine they've all been bucketed. And we introduce a new vector, uh, which would be our query vector. And we process that through the same bucketing mechanism and we see where it lands. And then essentially what we can say is, okay, this has landed in this bucket. And that means that the most similar other vectors to it are the ones that are either in the same bucket or in the neighboring buckets. So what it does is allows us to compress our vectors into low resolution vectors, which makes our search a lot faster. And that is what you can see here. So we have our dense vectors at the top. Typically we're using dense vectors for this and they can contain hundreds or thousands of values and they're all typically floating point numbers so memory wise it's pretty heavy and what we do is convert them into a very small binary vector which is what you can you can see at the bottom so it's a lot more memory efficient and usually it should be faster to search although sometimes it can actually go the other way and it can and it can become slower to search than just comparing um, than just using a flat index. Now, at the same time, because we are approximating these vectors, the search accuracy is obviously going to decrease. But what we want to do really is to maintain decent accuracy whilst speeding up the search. And our aim is using XQ, which is our, our query vector, it is to return the K nearest neighbors as accurately as possible. Obviously we're approximating, so it won't be perfect, but that's fine as long as we get a decent speed up. Now, LSH with random projection works by splitting our vector space, which is a obviously highly dimensional vector space using hyperplanes. So, I mean, it's what you can, you can see right here. And the way that it works is that given a, a single hyperplane on the positive side of that hyperplane, if your if your vector a, appeared on that side, it would be assigned a positive dot product value. Okay. And then we would we would process that and in our binary vector, this would be assigned a one. 
on the other side of that, you have the, well, the negative side of the hyperplane. And if your vector is on that side of it, it will be assigned a negative value with the dot product. And with that, in our binary vector would be assigned a zero. And the reason that that works is we're using the dot product value. So imagine this green line down here. Imagine this is the hyperplane that I just showed you. We have that normal vector, um, the n that comes out here. And using the dot product, if the dot product finds that both of these are in the same direction, um, e.g. anything in this sort of angle, then it will take that as a positive. If it's on the other side, so you know, anywhere here, it would take that as a negative dot product, which is, is what you can see over here. Now, a single binary value isn't going to tell us much about the direction of our vector or the position of our vector. So what we do is just add more hyperplanes in there. So we, we add more hyperplanes and that gives us more binary values within our vector. So what you can see here is we have those, we have two hyperplanes now. Uh, the magenta obviously correlates to the uh, zero index in these vectors. And then the teal hyperplane correlates to these ones. The, the number one indexes. So what we would do is essentially just use <laughs> loads of hyperplanes, uh, which is kind of what you see here. So these are the, the big arrows and, and the points that you see there, the normal vectors. So where we're actually calculating dot product. Um, and then these are our hyperplanes. Okay, so here uh, for blue, we would get a value of zero and then here for example for blue we would get a value of one now let's start building this out in in code so we can actually see how this works so what i'm going to do is, is set the number of hyperplanes that we would like and we set that using a parameter here called n bits i'm going to say we have four hyperplanes just for this example in reality we'd use more but for now, we're going to go with four. So we have four binary values here. And all I'm going to do is um, create our vector dimensionality as well. So we're just going to use 2D vectors uh, to make it easier. And so we can sort of visualize stuff as well. So all we need to do is we're going to create the plane norms. And they are going to be numpy, random, rand. And the dimensionality there will be n bits and D, so the number of hyperplanes that we want, so n bits, and the dimensionality that we're, we're actually using. And we're just going to minus 0.5 because we want them to center around the zero, the origin of zero axis. You don't need to do this, by the way, it's, it's just so we can kind of see the effect of it a little bit better. Okay, and we get, we get these values. Now those vectors don't align to this visualization, but it's essentially the same thing. What what we have done is we've created four 2D hyperplanes, or we've actually created four uh, 2D normal vectors that we're going to use to build our binary vectors. So we're going to create these three vectors, A, B, and C. And what we're going to do is calculate the dot product for each one of those. So then we know whether they are you know, positive or negative behind each of our, our plane norms. So to do that, we're just going to do mp dot, and then we just add our vector and we add plane norms and we just transpose those. Okay, so let me, let's see what we get there. Okay, so we see that we get negative, negative, positive, positive. Okay, so when we convert this into our binary vector, that will be zero, zero, one, one. Now we want to do this not just for A, but also for, for B and C. So, okay. Now, what we want to do is say, okay, if it's negative, it's zero. If it's positive, it's a one. So to do that, all we want to do is write A dot. And we say 
well, greater than zero. It's a, it's a one, so it's positive. And we do that for, again for each one of our vectors. Let's see what we get. Okay, so now we get false, false, true, true. So the final thing to do there, although I don't, you don't necessarily need to, is just convert them. In fact, we do need to uh, purely to create our the the binary vector string. So we, we'll see why in a moment. It's fine. We'll do as type in. So it's essentially easier for us to visualize. And that's it. Okay, and we should get something that well looks like this here. Um, so you see here, that obviously the values, the the positions are slightly different. But we have a is on the positive side of the teal hyperplane, so one is of course one, and then on C and B are both on the other side, so they are of course negative. Now, if we consider a, B, and C. B and C are kind of in the more in the in a similar position, so we would hope that they kind of align in their in the values that they have a bit better than, than um, A. But let's have a look, see what we get. Okay, so they're the same. So that's good because they are very much in a, in a very similar place, which you can see from here. So A, B, and C. In this case, match up to what we're writing in the code. It's just the hyperplanes that are, are different. Now, it's these binary vectors that we use to create our LSH, LSH buckets. So what we're going to do is actually implement that just using a, a Python dictionary uh, to make it easy. So what we'll do is I'm going to put each of our vectors a dot b dot and c dot into this vectors list it's just so we can iterate through them a little bit easier i'm going to initialize our buckets which is going to be like i said a python dictionary and here i'm just going to set i equal to zero so this is just so we can loop through each of those each of those vectors so we're going to do for i in range length of vectors so yeah we don't need i there <laughs> So the first thing we want to do is, is create a hash string using the, the vectors that we have up here. So I'm going to do hash string equals, I'm going to do join like that. And what we want to do is join all of those numbers together, but we need to, to join them as strings. So when vectors, I as type string, okay. So if I make sense, let me show you what that does, hash string. Okay, so we just get something like that. Now, then what we want to do is say, if the hash string is not already within our buckets, is not in buckets.keys, we want to initialize a new list. So buckets hash string equals a new list. So we're initializing a list, uh, essentially initializing a bucket to put our vectors in. So initialize it, and then after that, we we just add, we append it to that bucket. So this is essentially what we need. Let me, okay, yeah, should should be fine. So let's print the buckets and see what we get. Uh, if hash string is, oof, what did I write there? <laughs> Not in, there we go. So now we see we have these two hash buckets and one and two have both been, been put into the same one. All right, and that's essentially how LSH, work, LSH works, but just on a, a much bigger scale. So now let's say we, you know, we, we have our buckets and what we want to do is, given a new vector, we want to search using that. We want to hash it and, and search. This is our, our query vector xq. So what we we see here, um, so we've got like two examples. One on the left, 
is an example. So this is we're comparing our query vector against two samples in our uh, LSH buckets. So XQ is this zero. It's been hashed zero one one one. And what we do is first we compare it to this vector, and we see, and we're using Hamming distance here, which is essentially, you know, do these two equivalent values match or not? If they do, it's uh, or zero. There's there's no distance between them. If they do not match, then the distance is one, and then we add up um, all of the distance values at the end there. So uh, with this one, none of them match. So we get like one plus one plus one plus one, which is obviously four. So the having distance between those two is four, which is, is uh, the, the biggest you're going to get with this dimensionality of binary vectors. Uh, and then we have the second one. And these ones match a bit better. So zero is equal to zero, one to one, one to one. So all those zeros. And then so like zero, zero, zero. And then this final one is one. So then that equals one. OK. So that's the Hamming distance. And when we consider that with our code over here, we, we also have to consider that there's a degree of a degree of information being lost because what this is how we're storing the vectors. We don't store the original vectors anymore. This is you know that essentially they're like final form in the LSH index. So say we have our query vector and it comes through as 0, 0, 1, 0. Like, great, we get a perfect match. But in reality, does it is it close to 1 or is it close to 2? We don't, we don't actually know. So we have to be careful when we're building our buckets to make sure that there's not too many items within each bucket. We need them to be reasonably spread out, but not spread too thin, because if we spread them too thin across too many buckets, the, the index becomes absolutely huge. So it's, it's definitely like a balancing act between having enough buckets, um, enough granularity in there to differentiate between a reasonable number of vectors, but not too granular that we just make the index bigger. Uh, because then it's slower than just doing a, a flat search. Now, what, you, what we see here is what we just discussed, right? So given these two vectors, A and B, they're reasonably far from each other. If we use a value of n bits value of two, uh, our vectors are not big enough to get bunked into the same place. We can't differentiate them. But what we can do, obviously, increase the number of hyperplanes or increase n bits, and then we can differentiate them. So so for you know these two here, exactly the same uh, buckets. These are not. We have differences here, here, and here. So we can differentiate between them, which obviously is, is what we need. But at the same time, we are increasing the size of our index. So it means we are becoming more accurate, but we're also getting slower. So it's yeah, finding the, the middle ground between them both. Now, that's it for the implementation details behind FICE. Uh, what we'll do is we're going to leave this video here and we'll cover uh, the FICE implementation in the next video, which I will leave a link to in the description so you can find that easily. Uh, but for now, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.